Okay, welcome back to members of a 121 Community Church in Grapevine, Texas, and our ongoing study in uh, New Studies in Hegel, published by uh, Holt, Reinhardt, and Winston in 1971. We're going to take a look at an essay by Finley entitled Hegel's Use of Teleology, 92 to 108. And uh, even though it is obviously understood that Hegel does compose his Christian philosophy as an uh, eschatology or as a teleology, it's good to see an essay dedicated to that topic, uh, even though most scholars have already recognized that. Obviously, our previous lesson on Hegel's ontological trinity is an eschatological trinity. There's a motion to the triune movement of the Godhead. So it is agreed upon by all Hegelian scholars that yes, Hegel is writing uh, a Christian teleology. And so I think it's good that Finley has an essay dedicated to it here. Let's go to block one. And we'll take a look at well, the headings are going to be block one, the logic of Hegel's teleology, and then block two, Hegel's eschatology for another, and block three, the eschatological standpoint as a return for the self. So we look, we will use his uh, method, his triune method, when we discuss teleology. Let's go to block one the logic of Hegel's teleology. Teleology in itself. The meaning of self-consciousness is derived eschatologically as the uh, ontological omega. I kind of like that term. The ontological omega. Dialectic has a teleological perspective. And uh, we know that. We know that for sure. The dialectic does have a teleology to it. It does have a uh, aim of the fulfillment of the kingdom as its teleological perspective. Hegel uh, uh, Hawk calls that absolute knowing, the goal of absolute knowing, but he means by that, from his Christian perspective, as uh, the fulfillment of the kingdom. So block one, note two, teleology as for another, as dialectic, of course, with a teleological perspective. We first employ concept uh, to a situation, then we apply a meta-logic that has layers of being because we rec we uh, recognize a determinate layer and a, then we recognize an inner layer of essence and uh, we are to discern concepts in their eschatological becoming. So again, it's a the concepts are revealed to us within their own uh, inner force of uh, fulfilling an eschatology. And we always remain open to self-critical revision concerning our uh, structuring of our re interrelational sign model. Now block one, note three, teleology as a return for the self. Teleology is connected to Hegel's dialectic. The concept or the notion is examined from an eschatological standpoint. It's always, uh, it's always eschatology in order to determine the telos or the prothese, meaning how does this concept contribute to one's journey after death? How does this essential concept 
contribute to the eschatological next realm of existence that uh, Christians affirm. Pure notion is eschatologically directed to become concrete. Hegel's speculative notion has to become concrete. The finite always veils an eschatological infinite inner reality. Very true. It's called the realm of spirit and it lies behind surface reality. The finite surface reality always veils an eschatological infinite inner essential reality. A realm of spirit that is uh, always evolving in an eschatological way toward the fulfillment of the kingdom toward Hegel's absolute knowing. Hegel calls the fulfillment of the kingdom absolute knowing. Absolute and concrete knowing. Let's move on to block two and take a look at uh, Hegel's eschatology for another. For another. It does move through the triad that we've discussed before, but Hegel, no matter what truth Hegel is trying to articulate, it always goes through the triad of logic, incarnate essence, and spirit. Just like we're doing here. We began in block one with logic. This is block two dealing with incarnate essence, and block three will deal with spirit. It's all guided by Hegel's notion of totality, his notion of totality, initially discovered in determinate categories that we can uh, initially discern, but then we uh, discern a more deeply discovered category of essence beneath surface reality. And we also discover internal dependence on interrelation. We discover through spiritual perception that, hey, these concepts are interrelated to each other. They don't exist in isolation. The concept, the concept of a cross is an eschatological concept that is a, a sign for negating sin, negating the, neg the negative of abandonment, negating the negative of God forsakenness. So it has a, a interrelated relationship to other concepts, especially the concept of resurrection, because cross has to be taken in conjunction with resurrection in order for it to become Hegel's speculative Good Friday as negation of the negative, because it is the resurrection that negates the negative of the cross. It is the resurrection that negates and overcomes all negativity in the cross for Hegel. That is the, so those are interrelated concepts, but there's more than that. The eschaton is related to cross and resurrection. The concept of eschaton, the concept of a, and we can go on and on and on, but the, the fundamental truth here is that all of the concepts concerning the kingdom are interrelated, and uh, our discovery of that interrelationship through dialogue with others helps us to form our uh, eschatological sign model our eschatological worldview, and our worldview will be a teleology. Ross's example that he gives us, which is a triune teleology, is a perfect example. You've got, uh, if you can visualize Ross's worldview that he presents to us, God the Father is at the top, God the Son is at the bottom of the chart as the uh, act of uh, redemption. 
redemptive work of Christ. And then to the left is the Holy Spirit lifting creation back to the Father through new heaven and new earth. So it's a teleology. It's a flow of the triune Godhead as a as an authentic ontological triune worldview. That's why I love the worldview that Ross has put together. It's accessible to everyone. I mean, my worldview, you've seen it in my summary chart of Hegel. It's a, I think it's accessible, but people just go, man, forget it, man. I can't memorize that. But uh, Ross's worldview is accessible. You can memorize it. You can imprint it in your heart. You can imprint it in your mind as a renewal of the mind. Uh, then it will exist as a filter. It's, it's just excellent. I love it. But it is a teleology. It is a movement of the triune Godhead. God the Father goes out of himself to create. God the Father then goes out of himself to redeem in the Christ-saving act and resurrection. And then God the Holy Spirit returns back to himself, lifting creation up through new heaven and new earth. It's a beautiful worldview sign model as a teleology. Ross's worldview is a descriptive, very accessible Christian teleology. And it's a circle, as it should be. It's just perfect. I just love it. I've got it memorized. I've got it in my mind. I've got it in my heart. And uh, I wish he'd present it every single sermon. I just think it's fantastic. The more people we can get to imprint that in their minds, the more people we can get to imprint that that sign model in their hearts. Uh, eventually, people will learn how to live according to that filter. It will become second nature. It will become first nature. It will be perfect. Uh, so there's your example. I mean, th th we've got with the example uh, from Ross's worldview, which is a teleology. Okay, all of that to take us to block two, note two. The categories of essence that we discover beneath the uh, surface reality are for others as a unity of correlatives. The category of force evolves, which is both subjective and objective. Subjective force is the fact that all of those concepts of essence have a teleological character. They have an eschatological character. On the objective side, there's a force because through dialogue with others, we uh, understand the concepts from differing standpoints from others in dialogue. That's why we gather in small life groups to engage in dialogue concerning those concepts of the kingdom. Okay, let's move on to uh, block two, note three, <clears throat> the categories of eschatological force. They do equal the final cause of teleology for Hegel, and they do create the energia actualization of spirit as spirit becomes concrete. Remember, dunamis in the Greek is potential of spirit. Energia is actualization of spirit. And Hegel says that uh, this eschatological movement, this teleology, brings about energia actualization of the divine spirit within concrete representations of Christian art, of Christian religion, and of Christian philosophy. And Hegel, of course, is our representative of Christian philosophy. 
Not a lot of people take that up, but uh, Hegel certainly does. And it is uh, provisional and uh, open to critique. You know, we, we never gain absolute perfection. That'll be something that we arrive at in the eschaton when uh, we reach the fulfillment of the kingdom. But meanwhile, we uh, remain open to critique and open to becoming more deeply mature, more deeply mature as those who imprint the heart with Christ and renew the mind with Christ. It's an ongoing process until we reach that uh, final eschaton. So now we're ready to, we've gone through the logic of teleology in block one. And the for another incarnate essence of teleology as a force in block two. And now we go in block three to the eschatological standpoint of what does this eschatology mean for the self in the return moment? For the self. It means that we are to see our goal in the movement of the infinite as our exertion for ideals. We work for the ideals of the kingdom and they're always just beyond our reach. They are eschatological goals. We become one with the infinite activity of spirit. We become one with the eternal infinite activity of spirit. Therefore, infinite teleology is Hegel's central notion, says Findlay. The absolute idea becomes increasingly more concrete as incarnate spirit. And Hegel had, says that again and again. Uh, spirit becomes concrete as art, as religion, and as philosophy. Return of particularity itself releases its moment for the truth as eschatological. We realize that the divine truth is an eschatological truth. It must become genuine as it becomes concrete. We don't remain uh, satisfied with speculative truth. We don't just feel comfortable with uh, dwelling in speculative Christian philosophy. As much as I love Hegel, and I do, very few people do, but I'm one of those persons that loves uh, Christian philosophy, and I really do love the study of Hegel. I really do. To me, it's, it's very powerful, and uh, it has meant a lot to me. Uh, obviously, Jürgen Moltmann read Hegel eschatologically. Moltmann recognized Hegel as someone writing philosophical teleology. And uh, for Moltmann, eschatology is the first doctrine of Christian systematic theology. It's not the last doctrine. Usually you, you pick up a systematic theology. It goes doctrine of God, doctrine of Christ, doctrine of the Holy Spirit, doctrine of the church, and then the last doctrine is the doctrine of eschatology. Moltmann flipped that. His systematic theology begins with the very first doctrine as eschatology. The first doctrine of Christian systematic theology for Moltmann is eschatology. Now it is Christ-centered eschatology, but the first doctrine is eschatology. Because just like Hegel the eschatological perspective, it conditions everything. It conditions the cross. How do we understand the cross? We understand the cross in an eschatological way. How do we understand the church in an eschatological way? How do we understand pneumatology in an eschatological way? How do we discover in how do we discover and articulate 
incarnate spirit as conditioned by eschatology. For Moltmann, eschatology is the first doctrine in any systematic theology. Where did he get that? He got that perspective from Hegel. Hegel, Hegel's entire Christian philosophy begins, step one, it begins with eschatology. Findlay pointed that out, and uh, I absolutely agree with him. Let's go to block three, the eschatological standpoint as for the self. We want to see our goal in the infinite. We work toward realizing the ideals of the kingdom. We become one with infinite activity. Absolute idea does have to become concrete. It does have to become concrete as art, religion, and philosophy. And block three, note three, closing comment, the return of genuine concrete recognition. Remember, we're seeking reciprocal recognition in the realm of positing. Reciprocal recognition in the realm of spirit, where we had gather uh, in smaller fellowships, life groups. We share the concepts of the kingdom. We discuss those concepts as the true. We uh, get involved in the reciprocal recognition of worldview and how we each shape our worldview, how we each shape our teleology, how we each shape our Christian eschatology. It all comes down to that, and uh, because we all can internalize Ross's uh, worldview that he has presented to the church, but when we gather in life group, when we talk through that in dialogue, we're going to have different standpoints. We're going to have different perspectives. We're going to have ways of uh, how that affected us, how that uh, made divine truth to us. And we share those things in smaller fellowship groups. And then that sign model that Ross gave us, then it comes to life. Then it becomes a living sign model as we use it and gather in dialogue with each other. Very powerful essay by Findlay, and uh, to me, it uh, reminds me of Jürgen Moltmann, who read Hegel as a philosopher, as a Christian philosopher, who began with the doctrine of eschatology. That's where Moltmann got that. He read Hegel as Christian eschatology, I've read Hegel for years as Christian eschatology. That's my interpretive filter when I read his work. So I agree with Findlay here on this uh, use of teleology. Teleology and eschatology are synonyms, so he's saying the same thing, Hegel's use of teleology. That's going to wrap up this uh, essay by Findlay, Hegel's